Diane, I think we are ready here. We've got a lot of folks in, so I'm going to let you tee off and um, kind of get us rolling here. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much, Paul. Again, uh, I'm from the American Rose Society, the president of the organization. And, you know, the American Rose Society, we have members in every state of the country. So today, of course, you're seeing a lot of people from across the country joining in to hear more about beneficial insects. As I mentioned earlier, our consulting Rosarian program, which, which includes experts that have been actually trained to help support any and everyone who has questions about growing roses um, are particularly interested in topics such as this so that they can fully meet the needs of a consumer in the community. Um, we're very gracious to have Paul join and, and to really share his insight. And we're going to hear more and more about beneficial insects. And of course, I want to give a great thank you to Jackson and Perkins, who is actually hosting this event. Uh, they are also a great partner for the American Rose Society. Wonderful. All right, Diane, thank you very much. Uh, so once again, for those of you who came in a little late, uh, if you can make sure you're muted, that would be great. And also shut your video down. Um, that would be terrific as well. And uh, we will go, I think, I think now we'll just go ahead and get rolling. So let's, uh, let's see how this goes. There we go. So this is, of course, the, uh, what we're doing. And um, I think the next thing we're going to do, if my memory serves, ah, nope, little advertising. Uh, so this is obviously, again, the American Rose Society, as uh, Diane mentioned, Jackson Perkins. I'm an independent consultant to Jackson Perkins, just so everybody knows where I, where I come from. I'm also uh, obviously have my own company. You all know uh, Paul Zimmerman Roses. And I think what I'd like to do now is show the video. And folks, let's just hope I can do this. Hang on one second with me. Got thrips? Better get aphids. Think I'm crazy? I'm not. And you're about to find out why. Have you ever released ladybugs into your garden only to find 24 hours later they're gone? Well, that's because you didn't build a host environment for the adults. You see, it's not the adult insects that usually eats the pests you don't want, like aphids or like thrips. It's their baby, the larva. So you've got to convince the adults to stay around and lay their eggs. And you do that by creating what's called a host environment, and that involves three things. Food, water, shelter. Let's start with water. Water for beneficial insects is really simple any source of clean water with no chemicals. Could be something like this bird bath. I've got various other little stands around that collect water. I can add water in from a watering bucket. I live on a farm, we have horses, we have water troughs. So all different kinds of sources of water, but make sure it's clean and it has no chemicals. That's the number one thing you need is water. And the next one is gonna be food, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. Food is basically perennials with good nectar. You want an assortment that blooms from spring all the way into fall. Now, rather than recommend specific ones, what I want you to do is to find ones that are localized for your area. So what you want to do is find out, first of all, what are your common pests? Thrips and aphids for roses are the most common ones. Then find out what are their predators in your area? What do those predators want to eat? What kind of flowers do they like? So go to jacksonperkins.com. Look at their perennials. They've got ones that bloom in spring, ones that bloom in summer, ones that bloom in fall. Bring in an assortment of ones that you like and you know are going to help you. And at that point, plant them amongst your roses like I've done here. Not separately, you want to put them in the garden with your roses. Because that food source is what's going to keep the adult beneficial insects around so they can lay their babies, which are the ones that are going to eat the insects you no longer want. So, you've got water, we got food, and now, give me shelter. Shelter for beneficial insects comes in many forms. The most common one is going to be the rough foliage from perennials and shrubs like this butterfly bush left over the winter. That's why I don't want you to cut them back in fall. Just leave them till spring, because this is gonna home a lot of beneficial insects who will lay here for dormancy during winter, and then come spring, they're ready to hop into action to help you with your garden. Other forms can be things like ornamental grasses. Those are fabulous for that kind of thing, for shelter. The other thing you might wanna think about are piles of old wood. Just take a bunch of sticks somewhere and just pile them up. That's a really good way to go. So the main thing to think about is just use all different kinds of shelter, rough foliage, ornamental grasses, piles of wood, shrubs like holly, evergreen, juniper, all of those different things, lots of combinations in your garden, and that's gonna give you shelter for your beneficial insects. We've been talking about beneficial insects, but I wanna pause for a moment to talk about another great predator that's gonna help in your garden, birds. Birds eat all kinds of insects. Find out what kind of birds in your area eat the insects you don't want, hang bird feeders, bird houses, bird baths, attract and keep those birds in your garden. 
So now that we've covered birds, we've covered food, we've covered water, we've covered shelter. You may remember at the beginning I talked about if you have thrips, you got to get aphids. Now we're going to find out why, and for that, we're going to talk about Mama Hoverfly's story. Here's Mama Hoverfly's story. It's early spring. She emerges from dormancy. She looks around at all the perennials and all the plants that are in there for good nectar. There's her food source. We provided water for her. She's thinking, boy, I like it here. This is a great place to raise a family. So you know what? I'm going to lay some eggs, but I know my eggs, my babies aren't going to be able to eat the nectar. They need insects that they can feed on. You know what? They love aphids. It's spring. Maybe I'll get lucky. Siri, when do the aphids appear? Hmm, let me think. Okay, I found this on the web for when do aphids appear. Great, it's now. I'm going to go ahead and lay some eggs and raise a family here in this garden that's provided me with food, water, and shelter. Now, I know aphids love roses. I got a rose right here. So I'm going to go ahead and lay my eggs into these roses. I'm sorry, can a girl get a little privacy for just a second here? This is great. I've laid my eggs. I know my babies are going to be okay. They're going to have aphids to feed on because they're not using insecticides in this garden. They provided a host environment. I've got my food. I've got my water. I've got my shelter. But meantime, back at the rose. Back at the rose, Mama Hoverfly has laid her eggs. They emerge. Those larvae emerge when the aphids show up. That's what they eat. They eat the aphids. Then they become adults. They then start to fly around the garden. But you know what? They hang out because we provided them food, water, and shelter in our host environment. Now, let's fast forward a couple of months. They decide it's time to start a family, but the aphids are gone. However, it's thrip season. The larvae love thrips. They time it, go back to the roses, they lay their eggs, the thrips appear, then those larvae eat the thrips, and it keeps going all season long. And this is why it all ties in and why it's so important. Because if I had gotten rid of my aphids early in the season, I wouldn't have had the first generation of mama hoverflies kids who would then lay eggs to deal with my thrips in the summer. That's why if you want to get rid of thrips, you got to get aphids. Now, the other important thing to remember about this is it's okay to have a little insect damage in your garden. It doesn't have to be perfect. Nature isn't perfect. In fact, I think a little insect damage in your garden is actually a sign you've got a healthy host environment. For Jackson and Perkins, this is Paul Zimmerman, and thanks for spending time in the garden with us. I am still unmuted. Uh, hang on, let me switch to the slideshow. Okay, here we go. Keynote. Hopefully you all can see that now. I'm gonna get rid of that window. And let me find my chat window. There you are. Good, all right, looks like we're in good shape. Um, I'm assuming now everyone is set back to uh, and can see the uh, keynote presentation again, the slide. It's got the Jackson Perkins logo and American Rose Society. Diane, am I good? You are good. Man, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So like I said, that was the video. We know we're going to be getting questions. Um, so hang on just a little bit and we'll queue you up when you guys can chat. And um, But I do want to cover a couple of things that I've learned since then. That video is about five or six years old. And like anything else in life, things continue to progress and we get more information. So uh, rough foliage. I mentioned it briefly in the video when I was talking specifically about um, uh, that butterfly bush and, and things along those lines. So again, leave it over the winter because they they live in that rough foliage so that's why you know don't clean up the garden in the fall also leaves on the ground obviously either your lawn is one thing but if you have areas where you can leave leaves a lot of native bees live in those leaves and over the winter as well so that's important that you do that so just leave that foliage um you know, it's just another excuse to not do that chore in the fall. So you can, if someone says you're lazy, no, I'm, I'm being really good at the beneficial insects. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. I don't really cut my perennials back until I start to see the new growth emerge. And I'll even wait sometimes until I start to see the beneficial insects flying around. I talked about hoverflies, for example. If I start to see my hoverflies out and about, then it's okay. Now it's time to go ahead and cut back the, uh, the rough foliage. So just leave it. Just leave it. It really is important for that. Um, well, that, that picture looks like my garden right now. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> that's actually my garden in on our here on our farm. One of my gardens that's in in now. Uh, we get snow that lasts about three days and then it's gone, which is probably Diane, not what you want to hear. But well, yeah, you know, well, snow is a great protector for our rose bushes. So I'm fine with the snow. Um, it's a little early this year for Wisconsin, but hopefully it'll stay. And you know, you're right in that. Even my rose bushes, um, I really cut my roses back in the springtime um, to the point that you know they're fine for the winter and. Maybe being a little bit of a lazy gardener, it's just easier to do that in the spring. And now you've given me another reason here to to wait until spring to do my cleanup. So that's great. Yeah. And you mentioned something, too, that's not necessarily related to what we're talking about. But you talked about, you know, the fact that snow is a great insulator. You know, for those of you who do live like where Diane lives in Wisconsin and that kind of climate, even if it gets below freezing underneath that snow, it's not. Um, it's a wonderful blanket. All right. There we go. This is something that I started reading about about a couple about a year and a year and a half ago. Hollow stems. Um, a lot of this is a penstemon right here is what this is, and the stems inside there are hollow. And what they're learning is that a lot of beneficial insects, and including some bees, will burrow down into those hollow stems in the fall, and they will actually lay their eggs in there. And they're that's waiting for spring for them to hatch. So if you take away those hollow stems, you're actually getting rid of an enormous amount of, of, of an environment for, for, for what's, what's basically going to be coming around in the spring. Um, when I cut them back in the spring, these hollow stems, I actually don't throw them out. I just sort of I lay them in the garden. I'll just, you know, kind of put it in a corner somewhere just in case some, some are still hatching or something along those lines. Um, so some examples of, of plants with hollow stems, um, echinacea. Uh, Agastache, which I have in my garden, I have uh, that variety as well. Monarda, Penstem again. I mentioned Rutabecchia. Some of you know that as Black-eyed Susan. Um, all wonderful, wonderful plants um, that have those hollow stems. And this is a nifty little graphic that I found. Um, I'm going to butcher the name, the Zirsa Society. Diane, if you want to jump in with your take on it, feel free. Um, uh, I'll just let you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you can see here in the spring, you cut back the dead stalks and then summertime, the new growth hides the stem stubble and fall and winter, the bees, in this case, it's for bees, but it's also beneficial insects hibernate in those stems and, uh, and then they'll emerge or they'll start nests, they'll lay eggs, whatever the case may be. But that's, again, those hollow stems are incredibly important, um, for, uh, see, I see one question already, Rebecca, we'll get to you, uh, in just a moment here. Um, so that's a very important, uh, aspect to do. So those hollow stems, make sure you leave those around. And so I want to talk a little bit about this right now, because I know that one of the questions we're going to get is, well, what, what plant should I plant? What should I do? What should I use? And, and gardening, as you all know, is local. Um, it really is. It's, you know, all climates are different. All areas are different. So I spoke to some entomologists and some folks that I know who are smarter about this stuff than I am. And I said, okay, how do we give people a practical tool um, to bring this into their garden? And so this is what we decided to come up with. It's, it's called reverse engineering it. So number one, what are the pests in your area? Okay, that's the first thing you figure out. We probably all have aphids in common. Um, we saw chili thrips come up a lot in some of the pre-questions, but those, you know, spider mites, those are probably the ones that we're probably dealing with, but there may be others that are more specifically local to you. Um, and then you figure out, okay, what are their enemies or what are the beneficial insects that, that feed on the, the one that you want to get rid of? So in other words, if you have aphids, for example, what local beneficial insects, I'm going to say that again, what local beneficial insects are native to your area? You don't want to import them if they're not native. What are native? What is already out there that you can lure into your garden? Then, as the video talked about, and you can find the video, by the way, on Garden Inspired Living channel on YouTube, or which is the Jackson Perkins channel, or my own channel, at, uh, which is just Paul Zimmerman Roses. Um, so then you figure out what do those beneficials need, beneficials enemies need, in terms of food, water, and shelter, the three things that I covered in the video. The food, those are those early blooming perennials, and those perennials that bloom through the season also that give the hollow stem. Those are the plants you want to look for. So if, if I know, for example, you know, a uh, uh, hoverfly loves agastache, well, I'm going to plant agastache because hoverflies are abundant in my neck of the woods. So just figure out, you know, what are the insects and what kind of food, shelter, water do, to, do your local beneficial insects want? That's going to be your guide to finding plants. Okay, that's, that's important. Resources, 
Local agricultural extension offices are terrific. Universities and colleges with horticultural programs. I'd give a shout out to master gardeners. A lot of local rose societies are beginning to provide this information, so check them. But it's local. That's the main thing to keep around. So, you know, well, I know you're going to have questions on this. We'll be happy to answer them. Um, but, uh, but this is a good thing to do. So, again, reverse engineering. What are the pests in your area? What are the beneficial insects that eat the pests that you want to deal with? And what are those beneficial insects locally to you need in terms of food, shelter, and water? And that's how you begin to figure out what perennials you, you're actually going to use in your garden. You know, Paul, um, yes. you know, what I find interesting, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, is that I've always thought about beneficial insects like I got to buy them, you know, and yeah. bring in a big box of ladybugs or something, right? And then, you know, I've often heard, well, they're not, you can't keep them in your garden. They're going to fly away, right? So this this concept, of course, of building the environment for the beneficial insects, you don't need to purchase them. They will come in if you have the right environment for them, and then they'll continue to feed and, and help to, um, you know, support your plants, your roses in particular, of course, is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And one of the things I do when I talk a lot or speak a lot, and I even put it in, in, uh, in, in articles I've written, um, you know, we've all done this as early garden. I did it. I, I raised my hand here. You know, I bought, bought ladybugs at the local garden center or whatever. I released them into my garden and the next day they were gone. That's because I had not provided that host environment for those ladybugs. So what I do now in spring, I'll start to see aphids on my roses in early spring and I don't do anything about it at all. I don't touch them because I know about four or five days later, inevitably, I all of a sudden I've got ladybugs you know, dealing with the aphids and I've got, you know, hoverflies and, and whatever else is coming around. So you're absolutely right, Diane. That's an important point. You know, don't worry about buying them in. They're, they're there in your area. They're native to your area. So if you create this host environment, they will indeed show up. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also refer people back to the, the program that we did in September where we talked about uh, companion plants for roses, for example, because that will also help you identify those plants that will do well in your area that'll, you know, contribute and look beautiful in your gardens. And again, provide an environment for beneficial insects. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a webinar we did back in, in September. And I know that's available as well, still online. And, and this will be as well afterward. We'll post a recording of this. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And then, you know, with that, with that webinar can help you with too, once you know the plants that you want to use to create your, bring in your beneficial insects, that webinar will help give you some design tips of how to incorporate them into your garden other than just plonking them all over the place. Um, so a question that I have when I think yes, about my garden is that um, being um, the crazy rosarian that I am, and I have sections of my garden that are just roses, right? Mm -hmm. You know, 50, 60 plants. So um, how close do these, um, these other beneficial, these plants and th that we need to have in order to make sure that they um, can really have the environment that they need and still help my roses? Ideally, you'd want them in with the roses, Diane. Um, but I know that, you know, a lot of rosarians and do have, you know, standalone rose gardens. So you, you know, you may think about finding some beneficial insect plants that maybe you're only like a foot high or something like that. And maybe you can use them like as a border along the front of the garden mm -hmm. um, and mix them in that way. We talked a little bit about that in the design webinar about, you know, just using maybe three or four different perennials as, that maybe get a foot, foot and a half and just repeating them in the front of the garden to kind of create some space. So, but ideally getting them in as close as you can would be the best, getting in amongst the other, you know, that traditional mixed border kind of feel. Okay. And then along with that, I know that a number of people grow um, roses and other plants in containers. So would it be that we should try to incorporate these types of plants for beneficial insects along with the roses, for example, in the container or in a container next to them? Um, how would you suggest that is handled? I would go with a container next to them. Um, perennials can be, to use a word that a friend of mine uses, can be thugs. And they can be, they can really take up a lot of root space and things like that. And I think the competition, you know, unless you're using something like a whiskey barrel or something like that, I would suggest you use them and plant them in, in pots and, and put the pots amongst the roses. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and the, the, the bottom part of this um, is, is something to think about. The entire process takes time. Anytime you start using more natural methods, um, such as this kind of thing, it takes a while for nature to sort of find that balance. You know, you're going to plant the plants, they're going to come find you, it will happen, but you may have, you know, a, an aphid increase that first season, 
Um, you know, it, 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 and, and if that happens, you know, I'm not going to tell you, first of all, don't use an insecticide because if you use an insecticide, you're killing the beneficials that are, that are, that are, you know, that you want to, uh, bring into your garden. But, you know, if your aphids are really bad, maybe blast some, some of them off with water or spider mites. Again, the optimum word being some, because you want to leave some for food. So, you know, kind of find that balance a little bit, but obviously insecticides, um, are, are, are not going to, you know, you're going to undo everything you're trying to do at that point in time. Um, so where are we now? Ah, okay. More information about pollinators. Here's a couple resources for you as well. And um, I think that is the end of our slides. So we can, at this point, start taking some questions. Um, there is one from Rebecca. Uh, Will these creatures overwinter in a hygge culture? Um, if you're not familiar with hygge culture, it's, the, it's a, a way of building a garden by taking logs and branches and kind of stacking them up and then putting dirt in there and it creates this really wonderful compost rich environment. So Rebecca, my answer to your question is yes, absolutely. Because one of the things that I taught that, that, that some beneficial insects like is, is piles of branches. Um, so I would think a hygge culture type situation would actually work really, really well. Um, I'm getting one from Mark here. What benefits do bees provide to roses? Um, pollination, you know, I mean, that's, that's, you know, it, I mean, not that you're going to be worrying about that with the roses, but the bees need, need the, need the roses for pollination. I don't know, to my knowledge, if there's any bees that are predatory necessarily. Um, so, but, but, you know, I think bees provide, you know, bees are a vital part of our food source. So I've got bees all over my roses and I'm glad to see them. That's another reason I don't use insecticides. And Michelle, you were asking the question I knew was coming. And then we have Japanese beetles. You are correct. So hang on a little bit, folks. I'm going to talk about Japanese beetles some, okay? So unfortunately, the Japanese beetles don't really have a native predator. Um, there are some insects. I think assassin bugs will we'll work on them a little bit. And Baldo, feel free to jump in on this one. Um, unmute yourself and let me know if you want to talk about this a little bit. Um, birds will help with Japanese beetles as well. Diane, you talked about sparrows in your garden. Why don't you share that story? Yeah, um, I have seen, I've had a couple different rose gardens in the last 10, 15 years, and the sparrows will actually sit on my roses and eat the Japanese beetles. And uh, when it happens, you, I mean, you can just sit and watch them. Interesting story. When I built my new garden, I thought I'm going to put my bird feeder right in the middle of my garden because um, then they'll be in close proximity to eat all those Japanese beetles. But what happened is that uh, my canes, my rose canes started bending over, breaking. And I couldn't figure out what was happening until I saw the squirrels trying to climb my hybrid tea canes to get at my bird feeder, which I had put a squirrel protector on. So uh, note to all, um, place it close, but not in, you know, where you want, you know, you have to make sure you're controlling things like the squirrels. Um, but just, and it took a couple of years in my new garden now, but I do have uh, sparrows that are eating uh, the Japanese beetles. Of course, you know, the, still the picking uh, the beetles and, and placing them in soapy water is probably the most effective thing that I've heard of, um, especially as I've listened to uh, Dr. Cloyd from Kansas State University, who's really done an incredible amount of research on Japanese beetles. Um, but uh, birds will help. Yeah, birds will. I've got bird feeders that are in and around my garden for the exact same reason that you just talked about. Um, so with Japanese beetles, we, we've covered it in a video before, and I think we're going to try to cover it in a little bit more detail and then maybe another webinar, but very, very quickly, because you all are here. Um, so this is me personally, um, what, I, what I'm working with. Again, I don't use insecticides. And the one that is out there that is advertised for Japanese beetles is 7, S-E-V-I-N. You've all heard of this. Um, I'm not going to tell you it does not kill um, beetles because uh, it does, but it also kills pretty much everything else. So, you know, my, my, I tend to airboard it and advise people to do so because, again, you're going to kill your beneficials. There's a uh, you've all heard of like BT, Bacillus thunginensis. Um, you know, there's ones for caterpillars and stuff. There's one uh, called BTG, G is in George that is fairly new. And I've been working with this for the last year and a half. And there's a granular form that you can put in your lawn in late spring, about two to three weeks before the beetles appear when they're grubs. It kind of does what you've heard about milky spore bacteria. It kind of does the same thing, basically. That deals with the grubs. Then there was a powder form that you can use um, that you put into a sprayer, you dissolve it into a sprayer, you spray it on the plant and the beetle ingests it. 
it will kill the beetle. Um, but it only kills like Japanese beetles and maybe two or three other kinds of beetles. It's a real specific product out there. And then when the beetles then go to ground after you know the four or five weeks they're in your garden, hopefully no more than that, um, I do the granular again uh, in the lawns, in the grass areas to deal with the grubs before they go deep ground for winter. Um, I've had success with that, with BTG. Um, the other thing I do in the, uh, when the beetles show up, I tend to groom my roses in midsummer at that point, um, cutting them back, cutting back the tender young foliage and things along those lines that the beetles really seem to like. Um, Diane had brought up a point when we were prepping this about, uh, and Diane, I'll let you address that, about that, you know, the, 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 the rose that's being eaten can almost attract Japanese beetles on its own. So Diane, I'm going to let you take that one. Yeah, um, and in fact, that uh, I learned that from um, Dr. Cloyd again out of Kansas State University that some of our roses are actually um, putting up a defense against the beetles, and in doing so, that is really what's attracting those uh, more beetles. And his suggestion is when you start to have uh, a, an amount of damage on your plant, to prune it off, um, to stop that behavior by the plant. We don't think of plants as having behaviors, but they can. So uh, keep your garden clean, basically, right? And, and that'll help um, cut down on some of the damage from the beetles. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. That's that's and that's that's been another good thing to do. So, so that's a little bit about Japanese beetles. I know you don't have a whole lot more questions about that. There is one specific one that just came up from Diane Coleman. Um, do you put BTG only in the lawn around the rose garden? Um, like you, I have a horse farm; I cannot cover it all. Yeah, I do it on the lawn around the gardens, Diane. Um, you know, we have horses in the fields, and I'm not. You know, I'm. I, I don't think I can afford enough BTG to cover to cover 15 acres. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, I do it in the lawn around the, around the gardens themselves. So it's a multi-layered approach I use with Japanese beetles. But like I said, I want to dwell on that because we're going to, we will cover that um, down the road. So I'm going to fly down some questions here, um, folks, real quickly. Praying mantises for grasshoppers? Absolutely. Uh, you know, again, food, shelter, water, what do they need? But that's a very good beneficial insect. The list of uh, hollow stem perennials, um, it's in the, it's, uh, we will have the webinar up, but again, what comes to mind, Black-Eyed Susan, uh, Penstemon, Salvia, um, uh, Agastache is one that works really well for me. So anything like that that throws up a hollow stem like that, your local garden center or master gardeners will be a real good source about that. Um, talk about roses in zone 4B. Uh, this is really more of a beneficial insect seminar. Not really, I, don't, I think you're more of a cold hardy one. Um, we have a question here about beneficials over winter, but so do the pests. How do we know generations of pests won't be more multi than uh, the beneficials if I leave cuttings and leaves in the garden? Uh, you know, there are going to be some that are going to overwinter along with it, but hopefully you've got a lot more beneficials that have basically kept those under control. Um, I've done this in my garden for close to 15 years. Um, I'm an organic gardener. Those of you who know me, um, I've never had an issue with all of a sudden an increasing amount of pests in the garden in the winter, in the, in the spring when they come on. Um, wasps. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. They are really good. I've actually less wasp nests before and, um, and tough like that. Um, let's see from Lauren English rose midge is tough it tough in Kansas City at the end of June and August what eats this insect so Lauren that goes back to when I talked in the slide earlier and let me see if I can back my slides up hang on folks if I can get this clever this is so Lauren this is this reverse engineering um so you know you know that that rose midge is tough in your neck of the woods so what are the local insects that eat rose midge in your area and that's again your local agricultural extension office universities, colleges, horticultural programs, they're going to give you that. And maybe even your local garden center might be able to help you. So you find out what eats rose midge, whatever that insect happens to be. And then, okay, what is that? What's the natural native environment for that insect? What kind of plants does it like to live in? What kind of shelter does it want for the winter, particularly in a place like Kansas City? You know, water is clean water. I mean, that, that's, that's a normal thing. No chlorine, no chemicals in the water. Swimming pool is not a clean water source. So, so Lauren, I, I know that I, I'd love to answer your question and say it's insect A, B, C, and D, but I can't. Um, it really is just that local because what eats midge in your area might be different from what eats midge in my area and makes what's different from midge in Diane's area. So I, I, I hope that helps, but I would go to those two sources that I talk about there, explain what's going on, explain what you want to do, and you want to create a beneficial uh, environment, you know, integrated pest management might be the other word, IPM or something along those lines. So. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit with that. 
And, and Paul, um, yes, I, would, I would I venture to say that, you know, the um, the knowledge on the this type of thing is changing and growing and developing all the time, that there's more and more research out there on beneficial insects. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions on chili thrips as well. And uh, certainly um, they are doing a lot of damage to roses in parts of our country. Uh, I had reached out to Dr. Osborne out of the University of Florida. And uh, yesterday he and I chatted a little bit and he spoke about work that's currently funded by the USDA, um, Agriculture Research Services, Floriculture and Nursery Research Initiative. Boy, that's a lot to say. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Osborne and Dr. McKenzie, they are, are working through opportunities to control chili thrips um, with other types of insects. And they do have some um, potential news. Um, of course, it's still in the research phase of uh, predatory insects that uh, would take care of the chili thrips. But I mean, I think that there's more and more of that to come. There's a lot of research underway. And um, right now they're just trying to understand how they could potentially use this type of predator in the landscape uh, for chili thrips. So when I asked him the question, you know, what's the silver bullet answer for chili thrips? He didn't have one that existed today, but that doesn't mean one won't be available soon. So another reason we need to keep up on all this research and certainly the American Rose Society is one way to do that. Yeah, it is absolutely. I mean, there's always good articles in the American Rose Society magazine, um, and and you know, and in, in, and here at Jackson and Perkins, along with the American Rose Society, we're constantly doing webinars. This is a continuing series, and we'll always, you know, a year from now, I could see us doing one with an enormous amounts of new information. And um, yeah, I actually, I re when I was looking up chili thrips because I knew it was coming, um, I actually found an article at the University of Florida that was very interesting. So, mm -hmm. folks, you could Google um, chili thrips University of Florida, or I just Google actually chili thrips beneficial insects and the article is like the fourth thing that showed up and it was very interesting you can tell it's preliminary information but diane you just brought up an incredibly important point this changes constantly um you know i started becoming aware of this about a decade ago and um and, and even from there to now the information is changing again you know i did that video five years ago and you see new information about the hollow stems and things along those lines um so it is constantly changing so um <laughs> I think we're in, we seem to have folks uh, in pretty good shape. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. So a couple of things to think about. Um, you know, if you all have more questions down the road, obviously the American Rose Society has a Facebook page. Jackson Perkins has a Facebook page. I've got one called Paul Zimmerman Roses Gardening. We're happy to continue the conversation. Um, Diane mentioned local rose societies is also a good source. Master Gardeners is a good source. So feel this conversation can continue. Uh, we will uh, get a recording of this webinar up and post it, uh, and you'll all get information on that. And obviously keep the eye out for future webinars as we continue this series of uh, talking about the plant that we all love, roses. So Diane, I'm going to turn this over to you to button us up. Yeah, again, thank you, Paul. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. And I really want to thank Jackson and Perkins for um, providing this opportunity for all of us to learn a little bit more. Um, that's that's what this is all about, um, you know, getting getting more information that will help us uh, to grow and enjoy our roses um, much more in the garden. And uh, even though I've got a snowy uh, environment right now, I'm already looking forward to next spring. I'm doing my homework on adding um, companion plants. And now I have something else to think about is those companion plants that will help create a healthy environment for beneficial insects. So I want to thank you again. If you do have specific questions on roses, uh, we'll try to reach out to you as well to help you answer those questions. Uh, again, we have um, members of our Rose Society across the country that really understand your local environment and can help you enjoy your roses. Thank you.